Now, one of the most powerful tools, and I honestly think this is part of one of the reasons why Maya is so good for characters, are its retopology tools, and it's called Quadra. So let's talk about that. You can access Quadra right here from the modeling toolkit, uh, Quadra, like this. But before we do that, Quadra is based on the idea of kind of like retopology. So let's say I have a high poly. This is my high poly from, say, ZBrush or something. This snap tool, which we didn't talk about, if I click this on, this will enable a live surface. So that cube that I was just modeling is up here indicated, and I can turn this on or off. So I'll just turn this on. And with Quadra activated, it allows me to draw points and then hold shift to fill that with a face. Then I can draw two more points and then hold shift and fill that in. And as you can see, this is a really powerful tool for getting uh, a nice retopology. So you don't even have to do four at a time, two at a time or four at a time. You can just add a bunch of points, right? So I'm just gonna draw, I'm gonna do just that. Just gonna add a bunch of points, add a bunch of points and then hold shift. And it'll try its best to connect. A poly or a try. And you can hold control to add a loop to subdivide. Let's say you want a little bit more resolution. You can middle mouse to merge or snap. And then when you're done, you just exit out of that. I'll just lift this off the surface and you can see that that would be like our retopology model. Okay, so that's Quadra. Now, I kind of made the mistake throughout this entire tutorial of leaving up my custom shelf at the top, but I wanted to talk about that. By default, you've probably been seeing something like this the whole time. So under poly modeling, you know, there's a bunch of different tools here. So right here at the on the left-hand side, there's a little cog and you can go to new shelf and I'll just say YOLO. And this allows you to drag any kind of button, any kind of, let's go to the modeling tools. Let's say I wanted to add the ability to quickly access uh, merge to center, which is an awesome one. If you hold control and shift, it'll add that to your custom shelf. So I'm just gonna add a bunch of these, right? So let's say that tools that you use frequently, you can even add UV editor. All these things are part of your custom shelf here. And if you wanna rearrange it, you just middle mouse click and you can drag these along to reorganize it as you want. So let's just take a look at my shelf. I've got a couple, obviously I like having the ability to quickly make some primitives. And let's say this object that we've just kind of been messing around on, look at all this, this object history. It's gonna get, it can result in errors if we don't clear that history. I actually hit this button, delete history so many times. Again, you access that by hitting delete by type history that I actually, you can go to this menu and hit control shift and make it a button on your shelf to access. So I have a button up here that just deletes my history for me. So I'm just working away and then all of a sudden I'll just hit delete button right up there. So it's super convenient to have. I also change my hotkey so often that I'll hit this button right here. And this actually accesses my hotkey editor. Cause I'll just on the fly, I'll be like, you know what? I actually could use like this key to, to use this tool. So it just helps me like, you know, doesn't break my concentration as much. And then another one that I like to have on my custom shelf is this export button. So this is the same thing. This is uh, for exporting OBJ objects. So let's say I'm like modeling something like a belt or something. Instead of going to file export selection and then going through all that crap, I just go to file export with this. So that's really handy. Uh, custom shelf can just speed up your workflow a lot. And it can also be done inside of Max by going to customize, customize user interface. Going to toolbar and new, new toolbar and new toolbar. And then if I right click, oh, right here, you can start adding things by holding control and shift. And another thing that you can customize inside of Max, in case you didn't know, uh, is you can just right click on the modifier thing here, configure modifier sets. And that's what I have here are some of my most commonly used modifiers. So I've got like an edit poly symmetry, all these things that I use often like an FFD. It's just really quick uh, to have those buttons above your stack right there. So both of these programs have similar customization options and they just help you work faster 
and speed up your workflow. One other useful trick, uh, just really quick, is if you want to change the size of your manipulator, so you're, you're scaling things, on the right hand side of your keyboard, on like the numpad, you can use the plus or minus keys, and that'll make your, your handles bigger. So let's say you're working in like a big scene and you just don't want to be dealing with like tiny little handles, you can just make those bigger. All right, and so I think the last thing that I'm going to mention for this tutorial is just how to apply uh, materials. Because after a while, looking at these gray boxes is really, uh, really pretty boring. And unlike Max, which, you know, automatically gives you a color, and it's also really easy to switch colors in Max, Maya, you kind of need to add some flavor quickly. So the material editor inside of Maya is called Hypershade. And you can access it here by clicking this little blue eyeball thing. And I'll show you how to create a simple material really quick. So let's just go to, uh, we can just go to create materials and I'll just create a Lambert and I'll call this demo. So down on the left here are kind of like your default shaders. And there's also like a node graph, a preview, and then all of the settings under here. And let's compare it. It's very similar to the, uh, slate editor which i like inside of uh, 3d max i don't know how you guys use that compact editor that thing drives me crazy i feel so claustrophobic on this so the way to apply a material let's just uh let's just add a color really quick i bet you're all sick of looking at this gray thing let's make it a nice nice pink so select your object right click your material and assign a material to selection yeah, this is a thousand times better. We should have just had it like this since, since the beginning. But let's go through the steps of setting up like a, a normal material. Now you can work on your material by being inside the hypershade and we can just plug in all these things. If you want to attach like a, a bitmap or any kind of image or texture, you just click on these little checker boxes right here. But you can also close that and access the material by going to the attribute editor and my UI is a little bit messed up because uh, my kind of struggles with a 4K monitor, but if it weren't so messed up, you'd see this little tab here with the name of your material that's currently applied to it. And we call the material demo. So right here under the attribute editor, you'll find demo. So I'm just gonna pull this out a little bit further then we can see the maps. So let's add our diffuse. I'm gonna add a file and hit this little folder icon. So I've just got some uh, Textures ready to go for this, right? So this black arrow indicates that it's being linked to a file. Let's say I wanted to add a normal map and there's a little thing to do with the normal map, which is why I wanted to add this one here. So before you add the uh, normal texture by clicking this button right here, you wanna make sure that instead of using a bump that you convert it to a tangent space normal. So if you're making you know, if you're doing video game stuff, make sure you switch to tangent space normals before you add your texture. Click on that, link to the file. Got our normals. And because it's not really wrapped for this, it looks like crap. But uh, let's just pretend that we did a great job and try to find the least offensive side to look at. I think I prefer the pink one, man. Or let's just make a new object. There, that's not so bad anymore. All right, so if we have a lot of objects, one last thing I'll just mention is in the outliner, I can hold shift on all these objects and hit control G. And the way to hide or display things inside of the outliner is to just tap H and that will hide on or off. That'll make visible anything inside these groups. One thing that I forgot to mention, kind of like freezing layers uh, inside of Max. So let's say in max, let's say I made a bunch of copies of these, right? And I wanted to lock one of them. You just hit the freeze button inside of the uh, scene explorer and I can't click it, right? I can click everything else except for that. 
Well, in Maya, it's a little bit different. You can pick a bunch of objects. Let's just say whatever. Tic-tac-toe. Right? And under the channel box right here, there's a layers setup. So I can create a new layer. So this layer has all the boxes on it right now. But if I click this thing, my selection will become its own layer. Right? So now that diagonal row is on a layer of its own. And I can just select all the objects like that. And let's say I want to freeze them. Uh, T, I think, freezes it and also R makes it a reference layer. So I can't, I can no longer select those boxes. So that's a way of freezing things inside of Maya. A little bit different than Max. So now I can select all these. And if I move it, those boxes will still be there. All right, so I think that's it for this video. Um, I got a, a lot of more things to tell you actually about Maya, uh, but I'll do that in another, another chapter. So uh, hopefully you thought that was useful and uh, thanks for watching.